1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 19 through 27. The Apostle Paul says, For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, that I might win the more. And to the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I may by all means save some. And I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. And everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buff up my body and make it my slave, lest possibly, after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you for your word. We're so thankful that you teach us, Lord, everything that we need to be able to be conformed to your image, everything that we need to be able to carry out your mission. We are just so thankful, Father, for the reminders that you have herein, the exhortations, the, the reproof, and even the rebuking, Lord, that comes our way from your word, because we do want to share your holiness. Lord, we're thankful that you have considered us faithful and put us into service, shared your mission with us, and we are excited, Lord, to do our part in taking this good news throughout the world. I ask that you be with me today as I preach your word, that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it myself a little bit today, and uh, I mean, it's, it's particularly for me in this in this sense that sometimes I do find life, there's, there's times I'm cruising along, everything's easy, crushing it, feel, you know, the feelings are like smooth sailing, just going to town, this is great. Every, and then there are other times that it's like, it's fight, it's fight. And I don't know what it is, but the last few weeks, month, Mr. Overcheerful himself in the mornings, my alarm clock goes up, I wake up, and I don't want to get out of bed. Now, once I get out of bed, I'm still Mr. Cheerful, don't get me wrong. But I just like, you know, this is, I'll just lay here for a while. I'll read, go back to sleep, think, you know, whatever. It is. Okay, Wilson. Get those lazy bones up and going here. But that's, so, so I was in Corbin last week, had, talked, had read in his opening the last bit of 1 Corinthians 9 about winning. And I wanted to just come back and hit some of those principles of winning. Some, this message, I preached a lot of this message, very parallel, actually almost exactly the same with a few curves back in like August. But I needed the reminder. I figured if I need the reminder and I'm the guy who preached it, probably most of the rest of you guys don't even remember that I preached it. That's just the way this works. So, so I'll, I'll hit it again. It, a little different focus, though. I want to talk today about the context. I want to talk about characteristics of winners. And that is where a lot of this message is going to be. And then with the, the goal to win one more. You know, the 1 Corinthians 9.24. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run? but only one receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. This is important. We want to win. God wants us to be winners. And I think the following, this verse and the following are familiar to us, but I want, and I am going to focus. That's where a lot of this message is going to focus on today. But I want us to notice the context here. The stuff that we read prior to this. How do I say this? Have you ever in your life, well, let's, let's start physical and then we'll move to the spiritual. Have you ever in your life been not 
particularly motivated to do a certain thing for yourself. Like, there's, I, I'm fine. I'm content with the way it is. But then maybe you have, you get married and have kids. Your kids come along or something, you know. Say, for my kids, I really should do this. Like, I probably need to make a change here for the benefit of my children, as an example. In the physical realm, I know that's been for me. There's things in my life, having kids, one of the things that really made me grow up. Because there's things you want them to grow up. And you got to grow up yourself. You're going to ask them to grow up. And then how about in the spiritual realm? I'm, I'm okay the way I am. I'm doing fine. God understands my heart. You know, this is where I am. He knows what I, what I want to do the right thing. And, but maybe some of these things, ah, I'm, I don't really, like, there's not that much motivation to change. And then you realize if you don't grow and change in some of these areas, you are not going to be able to help other people make it to heaven. The extra motivation there. And that's the context. The context started in verse 19. The Apostle Paul says, Though I'm free from all men, I've made myself a slave to all, that I may win the more. This is the context in which then he shifts over into personal victory. The reality of it is, if we want to win others, we got to win ourselves. Now, it, and I I'm, will I'm, just push us all a little bit for a second. I mean, some of us, this is, we're totally... Our behavior is such that it's righteous and we're on the right path and we would ask anybody in good conscience, follow me. But some of us are in that mode where there's certain things we do that are not consistent with Christ-like character. But whatever the games are that we are able to play with ourselves, we show up here, we partake the Lord's Supper, we're checking off the list, which is an important thing. I actually like what, I'll come back to what Cliff said. But we're not really that engaged in this race. Now, I just want you to ask yourself for a second. If somebody who's a non-Christian, they're interested, they want to be a Christian, and they say, what does a Christian look like? And we held you, God held you up and said, this is what a Christian looks like. You follow them 24-7 and you be just like them. Is that something that you would be, do you think that's good? If it's not something that's consistent with who you would want a Christian to be, then it's come back, let's work on some things to win ourselves. So I want to, I want to hit this, like I said today, I'm, I'm preaching myself a little bit today, just a reminder of some characteristics of winners. Scripture says, run to win. In, in verse 26, therefore I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not being there. There is a purpose. Verse 24, run in such a way that you may win. So what does winning mean? Well, we're talking about spiritually here. We're talking about receiving the crown of glory, right? We're talking about Jesus at the end saying, well done, good and faithful service. Well done, good and faithful slave. Enter into the joy of your master. We win that imperishable wreath. So it's a few ways to surely not win. Do not start. Some of us maybe are trying to want to get other people on the right track, but we're not even in ourselves. If you're not in Christ Jesus, you can't help anybody else win. So the did not start, if you don't start the race, there's no way you're going to finish it and be a winner. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, he, he goes through that. He says, I got to turn there. My, I hope my brain's not going along with my voice here. Matthew 7 verse 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, in your name that cast out demons, in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Guys, they, I, I just want to set the stage in our mind and remind us, there is a day of judgment coming. 
And I can't imagine anything worse in that than to, when, when Jesus is saying, checking his list, I cannot imagine anything worse than him saying, I do not know you. We want to make sure we're in, we started this race, that we are in Christ and he is in us, that we know him and he knows us. Another way not to win this race, and that's the DNF, did not finish. Revelation chapter 21. Getting immersed into Christ faithfully is, it's the start. You're not in the race unless you've been immersed into Christ. But it's not the finish, is it? Okay. On the, on the day of judgment, it's going to be important, essential, that you are immersed into Christ. But you also just can't pull out your baptismal certificate. Not that we make those, but I'm using that metaphorically to tell God. Okay, Revelation 21, 7 and 8. He who overcomes shall inherit these things. I will be his God. He will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolatries and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Got to finish this thing faithfully. We're going to be winners. How about the disqualified? 2 Timothy chapter 2. I think last time I brought this up, I, I preached this, 2 Timothy 2, verse 5. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. Last time I know I mentioned Lance Armstrong, okay? very famous for his steroids, the, the cheating that he took steroids to win all of those Tour de France's, etc. But today I want to, I've got another name for you. If I say this name, Rosie Ruiz. Does that name ring a bell with anybody here? Rosie Ruiz, Mr. Hoffman, does any? Gary, a few of you. Hey, it's, it's old, like, this is old school. But Rosie Ruiz is one of the most famous cheaters in the history of sports. Supposedly, she won the female Boston Marathon in 1980. Now, there were some things that were a little weird. Some of you, a few of you runners might know the name Bill Rogers. Okay. Bill Rogers won the Boston Marathon multiple years. But he thought it was really strange that this lady who won the Boston Marathon in, in a time of two hours and 31 minutes, that she didn't know what intervals and splits were. Okay. If you're a runner, you know what splits are. and You know what intervals are. Okay. It was weird that she seemed to be so energetic. He said, well, I just woke up feeling good this morning. Well, what this lady did is she, I'm not, I'm not sure if she started, left, and then caught a ride and came back. Actually, just to qualify for the Boston Marathon, come to find out, she took the subway in the New York City Marathon to get close to the finish line and then got her time to qualify for the Boston Marathon. And then she really improved her time between the New York City Marathon and the Boston Marathon. The lady didn't run a bunch of the race. Now, a little tougher now with all of our uh, tracking devices for people to be able to cheat in the marathon. But she didn't run all of the race. Now, I want to just challenge us again, looking around the room. I think we're, we're pretty good about this. But some of us are hoping to not run all of this race, and we're going to turn it on at the finish line. I'll just tell you, it doesn't work that way. Jesus would say, if these things happen in the green tree, what's going to happen in the dry? Jeremiah asked some good questions. If, if the footmen have tired you out, how are you going to keep up with the horses? There. There's a reality that the times are easy. And I'm just going to mention what Cliff said, the emphasis that he had on the Lord's Supper of together. If this is not a spiritual priority in our life, the together of the Lord's Supper, if then how are we going to be present at the marriage supper of the Lamb? 
I was thinking about all the preparation that God did for this meal. Someone was talking about the preparation recently. Appreciate all the ladies, by the way, who, who prepare this on a weekly basis. But the preparation that God did starting way back there with the Passover, he knew where he was going all along. He set all of that in place, set up the, the yearly memorial Passover meal for that day that Jesus is going to be on the cross. All those Jews are going to be there in Jerusalem. And, there, and then Jesus goes the next step, doesn't he? And he prepares, he talks about how he earnestly desires to eat this. This is preparation, brother, for that final meal. So it's priority in our lives. We don't want to be disqualified. Don't be trying to take shortcuts that won't get you there. How can you help others unless you yourself are winning the race? Finish faithfully is important. I'm really thankful for some of the brethren. I'll just mention Judy Hirsch today as an example to me of just running this thing through faithfully. Judy's one of the first people I remember as a kid, as a Christian, and to see her push through all the way to the end, a great example. I want to hit some characteristics of winners today. Again, pretty rapid fire. The most important part came up in our adult Bible school class, trust in God. If you try to do all of this on your own, you won't make it. I mentioned this recently. I ask myself sometimes, can you do this, Luke? And my first answer is no, not by myself. Can you do this, Luke, with the Holy Spirit, the Lord's help, every, all of his, absolutely. So our first step is trust in God. If we're going to talk about being spiritual winners, the first part, it starts with trust in, in God. Romans 9, 16 says, it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs, but on God who has mercy. We are all dependent on the Lord. We can't even talk about winning spiritually except what Jesus has done and continues to do for us. Amen? Okay. It's important. So this is, this is where we start. We know that the Jews, as a whole, they were, were running this race, but they did not pursue it by faith. They didn't make it because they didn't pursue it by faith. They were trying to do it by, on their own by means of the law. It doesn't work. I'm going to come back to this a second too, but Julie just reminded me recently in a very encouraging way, like, the Lord's with you. The Lord's with you. Didn't Jesus say, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end. The Lord, if the Lord is with us, what are the odds? But we'll just ask this question. Once God gave the instructions to Noah for the ark and Noah committed to building the, that ark what were the odds that that ark was going to get built 100% was Noah going to die too early before that thing got done no way once God gave the instruction and Noah by faith committed to it it was going to get done absolutely guaranteed the Lord is with us and so we trust in him first and foremost. Desire for greatness. I actually meant to bring this today, and I, I forgot to, but I'll just say truth seekers, truth seekers want something more out of life. Sometimes we wanna, we're looking for the right people. Now, this doesn't mean always people that look like they're interested in winning, but sometimes truth seekers actually have had really rough life. They've actually lost over and over and over again. But something inside of them says, there's something more here. And that's what I'm trying to find. We are looking for truth seekers, and truth seekers want something more out of life. I meant to bring this today. Mr. Ashley gave me a really nice man in the arena. I actually was going to bring it and, and read this. But one of the things you get out of Teddy Roosevelt's speech there in that I like the way, you know, basically he said it's not the critic who counts, right? It's the man who's in the arena, marred by dust and blood and all this other stuff, who, who basically wasn't afraid to, to go down trying. And I think at the end, he says, so his fate will not be with those cold and timid souls who knew neither victory nor defeat. I never wanted to be one of those cold and timid souls. 
Coward's place are in the lake of fire. We read it. I want to be in the fight, in the arena. Truth seekers want something more out of life. And so those who are, us who are Christians, one of the characteristics of us is we seek for glory and honor and immortality. It's a weird thing. Sometimes you get this perspective from Christians that a good Christian is somebody who just sits there in the pew and behaves politely. That's not a Christian. A Christian is somebody who's seeking for glory and honor and immortality. That's the person that God grants eternal life to. Now, you can do it the wrong way, okay? The rest of the scripture is going to bear that out. But there is something here that if we don't have that within ourselves, a desire for spiritual greatness, we will never be in the arena. Somebody hogtied us, dunked us in the tank because we knew that's something you should do and there was never anything inside of us that that intensely wanted this we want more and we're looking for those who want more the apostles i find it interesting one of the a few on a few occasions they were arguing amongst themselves as to who was greatest jesus had to teach him what true greatness looked like But it's interesting to me, these guys wanted to be great. We want to be great spiritually. There's a Super Bowl today. I don't, I'm not, Bobcats aren't in it, so I don't really care that much. (laughs) Ah, But I did read something. There's a tight end for the 49ers. Brian Schweitzer, do you remember the George Kittle? I thought you might know. Um. But one of the things George Kittle, I saw his teammate said, he'll hear George Kittle somewhere before the game in the locker room just talking to himself, and he'll, he'll say, be great today. There's a mindset there of being great, and winners have that. So I just want us to think in our life, applying this spiritually for the sake of others, I don't If you have a Super Bowl ring, I, in, as far as the world goes, that's a big deal. Who really cares? If you have, I know Taylor Swift is big in the Super Bowl. If you have whatever the album is that wins in a billion dollars, okay, who cares? But what if you impact one other person for their eternity. How much for to be in heaven with God for eternity, how much does that count? That's something. Jesus says, What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, here's something I can I don't have to do a lot of mental math to figure that out. That tells me that one soul is worth worth more than all the riches of this world. Desire for greatness, to win one soul for the Lord in our path here. To help in that process, even. Winners expect success. It is really, really important. Proverbs 23, verse 7, as a man thinks within himself, so he is. If you see yourself as a sinner, what are you going to do? What do sinners do? They sin. What do the righteous do? Sing praises. Oh, (laughs) that was from earlier in case you. Uh, If you see yourself as a sinner, you sin. If you see yourself as a spiritual winner, what are you going to do? You're going to win. So what about this? If you see yourself winning a soul. You know, it's interesting in my life in terms of in terms of working with people and trying to help people become Christians, there are periods of my life that I've gone through some dry spells where it's like you're taking shots, you're taking shots, you're taking shots. And why is anybody going to do this thing? And so, you know, actually, since I've been in Bozeman, it's been slower going than I want. 
I'm, I'm praying, I'm pushing, I'm, and uh, that's actually the context in which I was actually was telling Julie, I was like, one thing I know, because I know there's some other brethren here doing this with me, but I, I keep hammering at that rock. One thing I know, that thing is going to bust open. And that's where she told me, of course it is. The Lord is with you. And I'm appreciative of that. But there is, there is a reality here, brethren, that I, want us, I don't want us to miss. If you don't think that hammering at the rock is going to make any difference, what are you going to do? You quit hammering at the rock or you tap the rock instead of swinging at that thing. But you know, it might be the 97th time that you crack that thing. It might be the 105th time that you crack that thing. But you know that thing is going to crack. You're going to keep cracking. Winners expect success. If you don't, you'll never win. You'll quit before the victories come. And so I just want to encourage us, rem remind your, you, what is your picture? Do you expect success? Do you expect success as far as other people coming to Christ? As far as other people making it? You know, there are all sorts of challenges. We do have some extra challenges of our culture. And we can talk about those challenges all day long. And you can talk about how tough it is. You can talk. And, and I'm not trying to minimize or trivialize that. But I will say this. You can talk yourself into saying there's nobody interested. I remember somebody in Billings come through and they told me they had knocked on every door in Billings and nobody was interested. There's a part of me that wants to say hogwash. I, ain't buy, I, I'm not, I wasn't buying it at all. They might have knocked on every door in Billings. I don't know. I doubt that even. But people are interested. And we are going to find truth. The Lord's with us. Is he helping us in this process? Expect success. Winners have a clear vision, a purpose. And that purpose is clear. One of the things that um, a book I read called Culture Code from a business perspective that I really like, one of the key, there were three key factors in a business being successful, and one of those is the almost overstating, overemphasizing continually what the purpose is. You have to know what it is in front of you if you're going to carry it out. Where there is no vision, Proverbs 29, verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. If there's, if there's no clear purpose of where it's going, everybody's going to fall by the wayside. Proverbs 4, 25, we know Satan is a master at distraction. And, and scripture tells us, let your gaze be fixed clearly in front of you. And so I, I'll just ask you personally, in your life, and I hope you think about these things, I really do. What does winning spiritually look like in your, in your life personally? Now, obviously, all of us are being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's a, we should all give that answer. But I'm talking about even some of the particulars. Hey, Mr. J. Wilson mentioned in his Bible school class today that God places each member of the body, each member in the body just as he desires, Right? So what is your place in the body? What does this look like when you are carrying out the purpose of God in your life? That's going to look different for different ones of us. We have different strengths, okay? personality strengths, etc. What does that look like in your life? If you don't know what that looks like, you're going to have a hard time winning. Now that, that thing can crystallize. It can, it can even change shape a little bit as you go through. But you better have a starting spot in your mind of what winning spiritually looks like or how are you going to win? And then what about Jesus' vision for us as his church? One thing about winners, they see the big picture and they keep coming back to it. Just think about whatever area of your life this might apply to you. Maybe you're, if you're a business owner or if you got some financial goals, goals in your family or whatever the case may be, if you can make an analogy that will work for you. But have you, I know for me sometimes, I'll have a big picture, I got a goal, I got a mission, I got a plan, and then I start going about my day-to-day -day life 
and I can lose a little bit of that focus. And so some of the day-to-day -day things, the urgent ends up getting in the way of the important. The, the necessity things end up, basically life ends up running me instead of me running life. You got to come back to this, brethren, and I just want to encourage you again. In your life, come back to this. What does this look like? Winners come back to the big picture over and over again. Jesus gives us a big picture for his church. And this, this picture, he left it. He said, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So that's the mission that he's given to us. We might say it this way, converting sinners and perfecting saints. Both of these are important, aren't they? If we don't convert sinners, there's no saints to perfect. If we're not being perfected as saints, then we're never going to convert sinners. So the two things really go together in the Lord's body. Consistency. Winners have consistent, disciplined habits. This may be the singular. Well, all those other things are important too. This is important. Every winner is consistent. I actually, I'm going to pick on Braden. He's my, my buddy. I've known him for a long time. And uh, actually, first time I remember meeting you, you were a little, anyways. Uh, didn't like me very much when I came to your house when you were a little guy. Weren't very nice to me, but we've worked out our differences since then. Uh, but I asked Braden today, I asked him how he was, how he's doing, you know, he, and uh, I don't remember exactly what my question was, but basically in school, you fight and win and, and you're like, slowly. Is that right? So, and we end up talking about the slow grind. Guys, most... Most wins come slowly. This is the truth. If you're consistent, the wins come slowly. If you're not consistent, the losses come slowly. But being consistent, it sets apart winners from everybody else. And so I want to go back to 1 Corinthians 9. I just want to read this passage, verse 24 through 27. Do you not know that those who run the race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. Our adult Bible school class kind of this stuff came up in. And I liked what Josh Wallace said. One of his comments at the end of that is we are, wow, I just lost it. We are enduring and cultivating this, basically this consistent, persistent attitude is the way I'm going to summarize that. Winners do that. Winners, we are in it for the long haul, day in, day out. And I will notice something from my life. When I used to run competitively, the summertime, if I, if I didn't keep some sort of training log, couple, there were a number of factors involved in this, but what, the big one I want to hit here is if I didn't keep some sort of training log, it is easy to kid yourself about how many days you ran. I can get done... And I can, you know, so it's taking one day off a week. I can get to the end of that week, and I can say, yeah, I, I ran, I think, about six days this week. About, about six. That's kind of interesting, isn't it? And really, I ran five. Or I think I ran about five, and really, you ran four days that week. Consistency means there's a means of, like, consistency, tracking, okay? making sure you are being honest with yourself along the way. Self-control in all things. I've used an example of, I'll, I'll actually use a slightly different one, female sprinter in this last Olympics for the U.S. She won the Olympic trials. Okay. She didn't make it to the, she didn't get to go to the Olympics. You know why? Test positive for marijuana. Did she know that that was on the list of banned substances for, I, I don't know, I'm no marijuana expert. I don't know how long it takes to get out of your system, but it doesn't take that long. She knew, and she didn't have the discipline or the self-control to stay away from that so she could make it to the Olympics. Wow. Four years wasted, if you will. Okay. Self-control in all things. Paul says, I discipline my body, and I make it my slave. You know, the... Eternity, eternity is a long time. And sometimes it can feel like it's a long ways off. 
But part of us making it to eternity, brethren, is being, is having self-control in all things. That means the eternal is what drives us in the moment. We are living in a culture where it is very much pitched to instant gratification. Instant gratification. You want it? You got it. You want it? You got it. You want it? You got it. And I fall a little prey to that sometimes in my life in terms of just a general falling into that mentality. Stick stuff in the microwave, boom, hit the button, go. Okay? Oh, you want something? I don't have to go to a store. Amazon shopping. Right? There is so much across the board designed to feed our instant gratification. Let me just ask you one question. How'd that turn out for Esau? Not good. And so we want to make sure we are being disciplined. Our, our body is our slave, not the other way around. How can I make myself a slave to all that I might win the more if I can't make a slave to myself? Starts here. Our daily habits must line up with our purpose. James Clear, like the way he said this, it's not that hard on any given day. All of us know, we've been to the gym. Oh, yeah, man, I felt good today. I felt good. It's not that hard on any given day. But the trick is what? You can't skip days. Your workouts can be reasonable and still deliver results if you don't skip days. Your writing sessions can be short and the work will accumulate if you don't skip days. We understand the principle. Now, here's a question for us in terms of winning others. How important is your personal consistency for the sake of other souls? If you're up and down, how are we going to impact other? How are we going to help other people make it to heaven? We want to be have consistent personal habits. Mental toughness, one of my favorites. Winners are mentally tough. Scripture talks about renewing your mind. I think uh, 2 Corinthians 10 talks about taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Winners are mentally tough. And I like the way that, I'm actually really excited about this. When the kids are done with Bible Bowl, I'm going to take a little detour off of Hebrews on Wednesday nights, and we're going to do 12 weeks of this mentally tough series. But getting into the right emotional state, to say briefly, four emotional states, the low negative is when you feel down in the dumps, like you got the flu, you can't move, you don't want to do anything. We might say people that live in that state are in a state of depression. Low positive, there's time for low positive. And I have to remind myself of this. There's chill. And it's okay, there's time to chill. Just you're, you're happy. You're maybe sitting around the fireplace reading or you got your family members around and you're just talking. Nice, easy, relaxed place. High negative, you are stressed out, amped up, mad, negative, type, you know, ripping into other people, whatever the... Well, your energy's high. Your performance isn't going to be real great. And who knows who you're going to negatively impact along the way. And then high positive means you're at your best. Okay? You're, you're consistently, you, you're positive, you're in the right frame of mind, you're expecting success. Those are the things we're talking, that we've been talking about. Mental toughness is the ability to get yourself into the right emotional state. Okay? Winners know how to do this. Is control of your emotional state important in winning others? I'll just say one of the things in my life I've mentioned that I've had to work on is self-control, and that is my keeping my emotions in check and not having outbursts of anger. If you have outbursts of anger and other people catch that, okay, how effective are you going to be in helping them make it to Christ? It's important, rather than for us to win these wars. Overcoming failure. Winners know how to overcome failure. This is, in my life, this is maybe one, this, one of the single biggest things I've had to change my mindset about. From the time I was a little guy, I was afraid to fail. If you're afraid to fail, guess what you end up doing? Who, let's see. There were three guys. One who gave five talents. One who gave two. Another who gave one. And the one who gave one, what did the guy say? I was afraid. I hid this in the ground. Where'd that guy end up? 
Okay? We, we want to overcome failure. I love Romans 8, 1, one of my absolute favorite verses of the Bible. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God wants us to go for it. He creates an environment where we can go, give it our best shot without fear of failure. The condemnation has been taken away from us. I'm thankful for that in my life. Michael Jordan, I like what he said. He said, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games, 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. That's why I succeed. Michael Jordan was willing to come back one more time, over and over and over. We aren't afraid to fail. We live for the opportunity. Brother, we are thankful. Anytime the Lord opens a door for us and we get an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with somebody, that is a win. Anytime we get to sit down with somebody, that is a win. We are thankful for those opportunities and we're excited about them when they come. The, we want to embrace the moment. We want to block out the noise. And along the way, we, we can learn. Okay? Michael Jordan, quote, quote two. This is back in the days of the Dream Team. And, uh, you know, lots of great players on that team, Magic Johnson and other guys. And uh, a reporter asked Michael Jordan, okay, you remember this, in line of what he said the first, of that first quote I read, how many game-winning game winning shots he missed and all that stuff. But they said, game on the line, who would take the late, last shot? But Michael Jordan raised his eyebrows and goes, me. That's a dumb question. Me. Why? The guy had no fear of failure. He knew. If that game's on the line. He takes a game-winning shot. He's going to hit that shot. Winners understand how to overcome failure and be in a position to win the next time. You know, the scripture says that a righteous man falls seven times and rises again but the wicked stumble in the day of calamity. One of the characteristics of a righteous man is he gets up again. Over and over and over again. And he wins in the day of calamity. The wicked man is stumbling in the day of calamity. How important is it to, to learn and try again to win a soul? Actually, I was talking to Charlie Brown recently, and I know he's not the only guy that has happened to recently, but a guy he was Bible saying with bailed on him. And so I was talking to Charlie and just encouraged him, thankful for him taking a shot. But one thing Charlie told me, he said, but I, I learned some things. There's some things I learned I'll do better next time. It's like, I like that. Okay. That's this process. Along the way, we learn, don't we? And we get better as we go. So we get to overcome. And, you know, one thing I, I do want to say very clearly is whether or not another person makes it, chooses to be a follower of Christ or not, that is not a personal failure at all for you. Okay? Our mission is to sow the seed. Our mission is to spread the word. Okay? But the responsibility, the choice is up to them. So if that's a picture, if you have a picture of yourself, whether or not you're a failure, whether or not they respond to the gospel, you got to take that off the table. Okay? That's got nothing to do in one sense with you. We want to be the best example, etc. But sacrifice. Winners are willing to pay the price. Romans 12, 1, offer our bodies a living holy sacrifice. We know David said, I will not offer something to the Lord which costs me nothing. Amen? We're willing to pay the price. We're happy to do so. Everything that Jesus has done for us, that attitude of gratitude that Elliot was talking about this morning, I am more than happy to give back to the Lord. What, what could I ever give to the Lord that would be too much? There have been times in my life I've asked the question, you know, or gone into the little, oh, well, I deserve it. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a second, Wilson. If I want to talk about what I deserve, I deserve a place in a lake of eternal fire. But let me, I don't even, but that's not where I'm going to spend my time. I'm going to take the focus off here of what I deserve. Let me ask this question. What does the Lord deserve? What he has done for me, he deserves everything that I could ever possibly give him. Happy to give him my life. Happy to give him my best. Happy to do my work heartily as for the Lord. Whatever that is. Because we all know, we work for people. And man, you, you know they don't deserve your best. There are lots of times I, I was like, and the, the flesh wants to take that out because 
you can come up with all sorts of reasons why your boss or why the owners or why the do not deserve your best. Well, I'm working for the Lord. Does the Lord deserve my best? Absolutely. Be willing to pay that price. I want to talk for just a second on people skills because it's interesting. The ability, how, how do I say this? The resistance to change sometimes in our life. And we say, we're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice. We're willing to sacrifice. I'll give my money. I'll, I'll make sure that wallet gets immersed that well, Mel was talking about. I'm willing to give my stuff. My stuff's the Lord's. All that stuff counts. Okay, I'm thankful for that. But you know, one thing that's tough is to look at yourself and say, you know, sometimes... Sometimes I'm getting in the way. <laughs> and I have two choices if I'm getting in the way. Well, three. One, I quit. That's what a lot of people do. Second is I keep getting in the way, just never productive. Or the third is I'm willing to grow, to change, to make, to be honest and make the changes. Brethren, I cannot t tell you how many times in my life I've pushed through things to... And I've had an awkward conversation. Now, sometimes awkwardness is on them. But sometimes it's been on me. Well, what am I going to do? Hey, I took a shot. But one thing I do want to do, I want to learn. I want to say, what changes do I need to make in my life? What changes in reference to people skills? Notice Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the context, he said, I have made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. To the Jews I became a Jew that I might win the Jew, etc. Paul was willing to make whatever things in his life, whatever changes he needed to make, whatever was necessary to connect with other people. Don't get me wrong. Paul was not saying, oh, I'm going to go get drunk with the drunkard so that I connect with them. People need hope. They don't need another loser. People that want to win are attracted to winners. That's what we're talking about here, okay? So we're not talking about going and, and, and partying with the partiers in order to reach them. But we are talking about connecting with people, getting, losing yourself, getting rid of selfishness, making changes, pushing through the things in your own life. The personality changes. Some of us, and, and this is tough. It's flat out tough. It's tough for me. It's tough for you to look in the mirror and say, okay, Luke, where do I need to grow? Do I love other people enough to be willing to make the change? I encourage us this way. It's part of the sacrifice. And to give anything left, less than your best. To say, well, I'm willing to do this, 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 but I'm not going to change because this is the way I was born. Are you a new creation or not? Can you make whatever, can you be changed whatever area you need to to become like Christ? Absolutely. So what will you personally sacrifice to win one soul? I got to speed this up. Persistent winners are persistent. Relentless, we never quit. And God is building perseverance within us. Some of the stuff from Bible school class this morning. Have a great attitude when that happens. And how persistent do you have to be to save a soul? I'll just ask you. I, I know that I really appreciate it. I just saw Joe Shannon and knock, uh, nod his head. Okay, you, Joe's been out there working on people, and you got to be persistent. Some weeks they don't. I'll just pick on Nolan Tool. He won't mind. Nolan was a good guy. Took me three. I asked him three different times in Bible study. He blew me off, blew me. And then he, when he said yes, he really wanted to. But Nolan Tool, as great as a guy who, as he is, evangelist now in Billings, there were a few times Nolan missed my study, our study. Working late nights, early mornings, and slept through his alarm. And I... Get there and no show. This Nolan Tool did that. That's what people, where people are outside of Christ, that's what the kind of things that happen. How persistent do you, do you need to be? God's building persistence within us so that we can help other people make it. Last couple points. Winners want to be challenged. We want to be coached hard. Jesus said, I preached on this recently, every disciple after he's been fully trained will be like his teacher. So Doc Rivers I like, I like this. He said, average players want to be left alone. We all know them. Just leave me alone. Let me do my job. 
Good players want to be coached. Hey, coach me. I want, I want to be coached. Great players want to be told the truth. I like that. My kids will tell you one thing about I never lied to them about their effort or their skill. Now, sometimes, you know, the, they would tell, oh, I, you know, I play, everybody else, all the rest of my teammates were dead tired today, but I felt I wasn't, no, you were just like them. You were stuck in cement with the rest of them. Okay, don't kid yourself about this. Or, you know, well, me and these guys, we're, you know, the good. No, you haven't worked hard enough to be part of one of those guys. Don't put yourself in that. Like, if you want to be great, you want to be told the truth. Now, that's a tough thing. To look in the mirror and tell yourself the truth is really tough. To, to open yourself up to other people to say, please tell me the truth, that's even tougher. Do we want to be great? It's interesting. I, you know, do you want to be left alone? Do you want to be coached? Do you want to be told? I have myself two rules, and I don't always wow, follow these perfectly. I don't give advice to other people unless they ask me. That's rule number one. Rule number two is, even when they ask me, most of the time I don't give them advice because they don't really want it. You know what that means? That means very few people want to be told the truth. Who do we want to be as Christians? I got to, wow, I did not realize the time. We are winners, brethren. We are going to make everybody else better. There is one race that matters. And there are some questions, you know, on the, on the tombstone. This thing's blank. What's going to be on here? Your name. Your name's going to be on here. There's going to be two dates on here. And then there's the dash in the middle. And the dash tells everything about who are we. Are we willing to be great for King Jesus? Are we willing to help other people run to win? What are, what are you willing to do? Now, this is me, too. I told you guys I'm preaching at me today. What am I willing to do so that I might win one more in 2024?